Lord be with you. And we welcome you into God's house today, tonight. Uh, I know that you were expecting <clears throat> Pastor Oswald, because that's our usual rhythm, on the first and on the fourth Wednesdays. Uh, you'd have your own pastor on our round robin. But I, I can tell you, I'm the one who threw a monkey wrench into that. I'll tell you why, too. Our little three-year-olds and four-year-olds at our preschool are singing next week, uh, Wednesday, and I'm their guitarist, so I should probably be there. <laughs> so you got me today, and you'll have Pastor Oswald next week. So I bring you greetings from our Savior and Burlington, and it is a privilege to walk with you in this time of Lent. Our opening hymn for today is, I Lay My Sins on Jesus, in 606. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, ruler of all things, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, healed all manner of infirmities and cured all manner of diseases. Mercifully help your servants to pray for and serve those who have ailments both in body and in soul. By your merciful remembering, cause us to remember those whose sickness keeps, the, keeps them from our gathering. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our sermon theme for today is Loving People on the Margins, Today Loving the Sick. From James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This is the word of the Lord. From Luke chapter 4. And Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now... Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases were brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Be we sing our sermon hymn, hymn 846. I'm 
to you, from our Lord and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord loves those who are sick. Today we consider how our Lord loves those who are on the margins, those who are passed by, those who it is easy to forget about in the busyness of all of our days. Our Lord loves those who are sick. So what does it feel like to be sick? Well, remember that there are many kinds of sick, right? There is the short-term sickness that my little kids go through on a regular basis where it knocks them down for a day or two or three, but then they're on their feet once again like nothing in the world had happened. But there's also the kind of sickness that, for instance, you may know, cancer falls into. The kind of sickness that makes you feel like you can't trust your own body. Have you ever been in a position like that? Like your body has betrayed you, leaving this foreign thing to grow inside of you, even when you did not know. But there's another kind of sickness, a long-term sickness, the kind of terminal case that you find as you grow older. The kind where you may be able to mitigate it by certain prescriptions, or you might just be the type who soldiers on through, limping your way through this injury or that, or you might get the surgery to correct it, but still, there's something of it that will always be with you. Always be there to the end. I joke with my parents now that my 30s, because I'm, got to do the math now, I'm 37, I'm going to be 38 soon, but so far my 30s have been my decade of finding out which of my diseases will be with me to the end. <laughs> Here it is, all the terminal cases start today. But then there is sickness unto death. The kind of sickness that consumes you, that doesn't allow you to think of anything else. The kind of sickness that makes you roll around in pain and doesn't allow for any other thoughts to enter in. And today we consider once again that our Lord loves those who are sick. But what does being sick do to you? Well. The words for sickness in Greek uh, may help us out there. One word for sickness in James chapter 5 means weakness. Considering that sickness debilitates us, it makes us weak, it makes us less able, it weakens our strength. On the other hand, there's another word for sickness used in James chapter 5 as well. The other word for sickness carries the idea not so much of weakness, but weariness. That sickness saps our strength to the point that we are tired of the effort that it takes to fight. Sickness can sap our strength to the point at which we're tired of living. Tired of the suffering that necessitates our moving forward. That we long for rest. Sickness is weakness. Sickness is weariness. A third facet of sickness comes from our readings from James for today, and I'll get to how it does that later. But right now, a third facet of sickness we consider is that sickness isolates us. It isolates us from others. You can't be out, not as much as you were before. You have less energy to visit and to chat, even when you can go out. It isolates us from others, and sickness isolates us from God. Considering, oh God, why is this happening to me? Lord, take this away from me. You remember, we don't know what it was, but for Paul, he talks about a thorn in his flesh. 
And the Lord did not take it away from him. Our Lord loves the sick. And he calls us to love those who are sick, those who are weak, those who are weary. Because those who are sick and weak are those who are on the margin. They are not able to speak for themselves. They are not able to act for themselves. And from the earliest of times, the Christian church is set out with special care for those who are sick. At least one commentator wrote about these verses that churches designated at least one widow to take care of women who were sick. At least one person was set aside as a volunteer in their church in order to serve those who could not gather. Christians, you may know or remember, are the ones who developed the hospital system as we know it. It would not look like what it looks like today if not for Christians through millennia who cared. And James, in our reading for today here, he tells us what Christians were to do. He asks this, if any, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. When he says elders there, he means the pastors, the public representatives of the church. And let those pray over him with the whole church, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, anointing with oil. In the ancient world, anointing the sick with oil was not an unusual thing. It was a measure taken for the health of the individual. In fact, it's what Jesus describes the Good Samaritan doing to the beaten man on the side of the road. What does he do? He binds up his wounds, he puts oil on them, he gives him something to drink, and he takes him to the inn. It's what David says of the Lord who is his shepherd in Psalm 23. What does the shepherd do when he is caring for every one of his sheep's needs? He anointeth my head with oil. It means, right, that the elders are to provide appropriate and practical care as they pray for those in their congregation, on behalf of their congregation. And at the same time that they anoint with oil, they also are to pray. Why? Well, because sickness can be so isolating. In fact, when I think about that, I think about how during the beginning of the pandemic, I couldn't visit any of my shut-ins. I couldn't visit one of them. And so I would call up the nursing homes where I'd have to go. And I remember one particular nursing home that was right on the edge of the lake. And I said, hey, if I can even just tramp out in the snow right next to the lake, I'll knock on windows if that's what you'll let me do. And so they said yes. And there I went in my snowshoes and my snow pants and tromping around in the snow of Minnesota in order to knock on people's windows to tell them that they're not alone. That they are not struggling alone. That their Lord is with them and they are never far from our thoughts as well. Sickness can be so isolating. And so what does James invite us to do? James invites the elders to pray with and for the sick so that the one who has this sickness is not alone, so that they know that they are cared for and they know that they are assured their congregation, their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are surrounding them. They are not alone. They are not alone because not only is the congregation surrounding them, the Lord also hears their prayers. And the prayers of those who pray on their behalf. They are not alone. And James says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Prayer of faith. Uh, that reminds us that prayer is powerful and effective not because of the one who prays. 
It's not a past, that a pastor's prayer is more powerful than yours. No. Instead, prayer is powerful and effective because of who you pray to. That prayers offered in faith are prayers offered to God who is our Heavenly Father. That God who is our Heavenly Father listens to our prayers as a dear Father listens to the requests of his dear children. The prayer of faith saves because of the one that you pray to. Now we deal with that next word. The prayer of faith will save, will save. Often, especially in Luke's Gospel, the word save in Greek, it's sozo, the word save is not only used for salvation from sin, death, and the devil, but also for healing as well. Saved not just from the ultimate things, but saved from sickness as well. That is, as we confess as Lutherans, Sometimes God heals us through supernatural ways, immediately, without any explanation that we can see. Other times, as Lutherans, we confess that he heals us through means, through the hands of doctors and nurses, through the way that he has made your body to be. There and then, it is still our God who heals. Both times it is God who is answering our prayers. And then James writes something that may perk your ears up a little bit here. He writes, and then if he had committed sin, he will be forgiven. Now I'll tell you this, old Jewish tradition had it that sickness and malady and bad time were always a direct result of your own sin. In fact, it is almost entirely the subject of at least one Old Testament book, the book of Job. All of Job's friends are telling Job that he is suffering because he has done something wrong. That his boils and his suffering and his distress and destruction are a direct result of his sin. But what James is saying here is something different. It's what a Christian confesses. Disease is caused by sin. Does that mean that there's a direct link from shoplifting to your runny nose the next day? Or from lying one day to the flu the next? Well, no, it's not so simple. But if there was no sin in the world, there certainly would be no disease. And that which affects the body also affects the soul. That which affects the soul also affects the body. And when we confess that our weakness and our weariness before the Lord, when we confess those things there and then, we hear proclaimed to us by the pastor and the congregation that we are forgiven. That the Lord who has taken up the disease of death upon his back is the Lord who sets us free even from temporal disease. That the prayers of the righteous, as James would say, have great power. That they work. That they will save one who is sick. Why? Because they are heard by our loving and heavenly Father. We confess that for the Christian, disease and death are not the end. That our God often hears our prayers in order to bring us healing in this life, and that our God has made most clear that he has taken from us that which is worst and conquered everything that needs to be conquered so that his healing may be, in the end, for eternity. And so, what other choice does the Christian have but to care for all those who are sick and weary along the way? Our Lord loves those who are sick. 
He would not let them suffer alone. Our Lord bids us to love those who are sick as well. He bids us not to let them suffer alone because it is his one body of Christ that laughs together and cries together, his one body of Christ that longs for the day when we are set free, his one body of Christ that even as we cry the tears of this world, we know that he has won the day. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand at this time. Please do know uh, that if you have not uh, given your offering, there are two offering plates at the back of church. We'd invite you to do so as you leave the sanctuary if you are able. We turn now to our Lord in prayer. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, and the glory. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you will forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands have been my myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn in 427.
Holy Spirit of God. 